Yes. Yes. I know Janda's stoking the fires, literally, not not in any kind of political figurative sense. Yeah, I know. She's she's really stoking fires. Stoking fires. <laughs> yeah. Which is a topic we have a seminar coming, a webinar coming up on uh, heat pumps and those coming up in the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks. So learn more about that. So um, I am recording now, uh, and let's see. We got about two minutes, so we got filling up. We got about. Yeah, we're getting a lot of people joining in. So those of you who are joining us, thank you so much for coming. And we'll do a little bit of a, a, a greet here in just a few moments. So stay tuned. I'll try not to do anything too silly on camera before while it's recording. One more thing to delete. Looks like we have a great turnout today so far. I think this I think the Saturday morning thing is going to be a hit. Yeah, yeah, I think a uh, little Saturday morning, especially during these uh, these winter months, you know, it's cold, so everybody's kind of excited to get out there and do stuff, so. Right. This will be the good Gator, primer can, for it, right? Gator, <laughs> can you hear me? I can, Janda, we're back. Oh, we are now this, recording. Right, so. I know, but I think you still have me off camera. I oh. do. Let me ask you to start your video. There we go. There okay. you are. Thanks, Janda. <laughs> Hello. Hello. My fire was almost out. It's going again. <laughs> for those who are listening in, my furnace died this week, and I can't get a new furnace for another week. So I'm trying to heat the whole house with what, a wood burning stove that's nowhere near where I am right now. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to get myself out of this meeting so I'm not in here twice and give anyone in, any sort of personality conflict there. Um, <laughs> just monitoring everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. It is 10.30, Saturday, January 30th. Welcome everybody. My name's Gator and this is the first of the brand new year of the Tacoma Enviro House webinars. Yay. And we have our very special friend, Jenny from Garden Sphere here and Janda, the runner of the, uh, Enviro House, thank you for getting this all started. Janet, why don't you get us started with some other, uh, why don't you say some things about what's going on so far? Okay, so um, this is, as Gator said, this is our first webinar this year. Um, we will be working out a few glitches because we bought our own Zoom account for the Enviro House. So we are um, learning a few new things that we didn't have access to before. Um, so please bear with us on that. Um, we have webinars planned. Jenny will be back with us again on the 6th of February. We'll be doing fruit tree selection. Um, what kind of fruit trees work well in our climate and a little bit on how to take care of them. And then in the afternoon, that'll be another 1030. And then at one o'clock, we'll be doing mason bees, which are the pollinators that come out early and um, help to get us the fruit on fruit trees. Um, the 13th, we won't be doing any because um, that's a three day weekend and partly getting staff on this end plus, <laughs> plus um, just people being around. Um, and then it will be posted on the website. I don't think they're up yet as far as the ones after that. We're, we're, we have them almost scheduled all the way through Feb, uh, March 27th. So we will be doing um, landscape tree pruning again um, the end of February and um, several others that are coming up. So stay tuned to that. The other thing that I want to mention, and we'll bring it up again with um, an on-screen document, but if you are not familiar with the tree coupon program, um, that is going on now and you can sign up for a coupon that if you haven't gotten it before or used it before, you can get a coupon that gives you $30 off per tree. And I believe it's up to three trees still this year. Um, from Select Nurseries, Garden Sphere, who Ginny is representing. Um, Garden Sphere is one of those providers. So I'll give you the information on uh, more details on the tree coupon and how to find it and how to sign up for it. So with that, we'll go ahead with the webinar and then we'll pick that part up later. Fantastic. Thank you, Janda. Uh, hey. It looks like everyone's got their coffee and their bowl of cereal to watch some Saturday morning fun. Um, I think this is going to be a big success. We already have like 16,000 people attending this webinar. No pressure. No pressure. Just kidding. Um, I'm going to go over a few things really quickly if you want to participate. We have the chat feature and the Q&A feature. 
Um, if you decide to chat, I send everybody a welcome. If you look, there's a two panelists or two panelists and attendees little drop down menu. Make that sure that goes to all panelists and attendees. That way, all of your cohorts, everyone watching on this attend attending this meeting webinar can can definitely um, see your questions if you have something really exciting to ask or interesting to ask. Um, the other thing is we have these polls that we're going to pop up during Jenny's presentation. Let me see if I can get that. I just tried to open it. And this is our first one. So it's going to ask you the, the very basic question that we like to know. How did you hear about this workshop? Now, it's an anonymous answer here. So all you have to do is click which one you found. Where? How did you find out about us? So I'll give you guys about 20 seconds or 30 seconds to go ahead and answer that. So, you know, vote early, vote often. And um, that way it'll get you an idea of how we're going to ask polls. Jenny's going to have a question or presentation and you're going to be able to answer and then we'll look at the results. So I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. Uh, you back there who is not answering, go ahead and do that. Uh, yeah, I can see who it, no, I'm just kidding. I can't see any of that information. So, all right, okay, let's take a look at that poll and share those results. Looks like a large percentage of you got this from a Facebook event notification and the Enviro News email, so that's great. Um, we're going to do other ways to reach out to more people. Don't forget the Enviro House Workshop. That's cityoftacoma.org slash workshops and that's where you can find out about upcoming webinars uh information about the web uh about the e-house as well as watch past uh webinar videos so all right without any further ado i am going to turn it over to our good friend jenny from garden sphere jenny take it away hey good morning everybody yeah so i am I, my name is jenny i have been with garden sphere for who it's nine years now, which has been great. Um, Garden Sphere is a wonderful place to, to get plants and ask questions about um, chickens and mason bees and all this good stuff. Um, I have a degree in sustainable agriculture and I am also an elementary uh, educator as well. So um, I teach all the time and I absolutely love this stuff. I am local. Um, I grew up in the area and uh, I grew up in Fife and Fife was all farms. So um, I, I remember all the corn and the cabbage down there. Um, today we're gonna be talking about pruning. And there's going to be some pruning care in there and um, different implements you can use on how to cut, uh, how to prune those fruit trees. Um, again, this isn't going to be about ornamental uh, trees and, and bushes. It's going to be more about those fruit tree pruning, you know, so you get the beautiful apples and you get um, an abundance of plums and, and pears and all that good stuff. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, There we go, share. Uh. All right. So fruit tree pruning and care. Um, if you don't know where Garden Sphere is, Garden Sphere is located in the Proctor District off of 34th and Proctor, um, pretty near the Puget Sound Park there. So it's super easy to find. When and why to prune. So pruning, a lot of folks get really confused about, or they don't know or unsure about when to prune. Uh, pruning, you're going to want to do in the winter when everything is dormant, okay? So the earliest you could prune would be, you know, that last week of December when everything, all the leaves are definitely down. Um, January, February. Once we start getting into March, then we start getting into pollinators and early bloomers. So really um, getting a set routine for yourself started is always really great. Cause you know, for me, I always do it uh, during that first week of January. So um, I pruned all of the apples and, and my grapes and got all that done the first week of January. And I do that every year like clockwork. So the January, February are the best times to, to prune your fruit trees and, and bushes and vines. The fruits are different, right? So we've got palm fruits. Those are going to be your apples and your pears and your Asian pears. Um, and then you have your stone fruits, all the fruits that have those pits in the middle. Cherries, plums, peaches, nectarines, okay? All of those, both the palm fruits and the stone fruits benefit from annual pruning. You're gonna to wanna to do that because it encourages the blossom 
forming. It encourages all of that energy instead of going to um, new growth. It encourages all that energy to go to the fruit. Okay, um, plums and cherries. You could do say if you have apples and pears, and plums and cherries, or any kind of mix of those palm and stone fruits. You could do all your palm fruits, apples, pears, Asian pears, do those in the winter, do those January, February, and your plums and your cherries, you could do at the end of August in that late, late summer when all of the fruit is finished. Um, it, it will um, benefit from that late pruning. But again, you only want to do it one time a year. It's an annual pruning, so you kind of got to pick your time. You know, do you want to do it all at once or do you want to kind of spread it out so the work is, is less on either end? I mean, it's the same amount of work, but you're just doing it two different times. Okay, and again, the fruit, fruit is, is what you're looking for here. So pruning is the way to get that encouragement into that plant saying, hey, I'm gonna make lots of fruit. Um, pruning also reduces your pest load, okay? And, um, and disease load. And a lot of times um, it will help with, with eye appeal as well, aesthetics, okay? So you're gonna have to think of a vision when you get these fruit trees with either they're young or they're established, really sit and look at them for a while and decide kind of what size and shape you are thinking about. Now you'll see in the picture below, it has three different tree styles, shapes. Now fruit trees are, are, are great to really intentionally prune. So especially with those, uh, the apples and the pears, right? So you can think of, we've got a central leader where it means it's gonna look like a pretty traditional tree where it's gonna have that peak in the middle and then it will fan down, kind of come down and around. Um, you have your modified central leader, leader, where it ends up being a little bit poofier. I like to think it looks more like a fan, okay? Not so, so tall and vertical, but a little bit more fan-like. And then you have the open center or the vase shape. I, in particular, really like the vase shape pruning and, and a growth for fruit trees. Um, particularly for those palm fruits, those apples, pears, Asian pears, um, because it lets so much light in. Now here in the Pacific Northwest, we are getting a little bit more light, you know, uh, as the years go on. Um, but overall, we still have our heat units. We just don't get hot enough and that heat doesn't, doesn't reach everything um, as well as say in Yakima. So it, we really wanna open that tree up, get all that heat and that light in there, all that sunlight in there as best we can. And the open vase really encourages that. Here is our first pole. All right, let's do this. Hang on, here it comes. When and why should you prune fruit trees? This is a multiple choice. Let's go ahead and answer that. Maybe you gave away that little secret there just a few moments ago. I don't know. I was listening. <laughs> All right, everybody answer. I'm going to give you about 12 more seconds. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, good answers. Good answers. All right. Going to shut it down in five, four, three. Get it in. Two, one. Oh, there we go. Zero. One more. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at those results. All right, look at that. Improve access to fruit and open for growth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because if you, if you can't reach it and it's hard to get to, you're not going to want to deal with that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not a tall person, but yeah, if I could just cut everything down so I can reach it, that'd be great. Like, like the dishes on the top shelf, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right. forward. Come on. Oop, there we go. All right. Just make sure that, yep. Okay. Right. Just, just take double checking. <laughs> All right. So we have some different tools here. So tools, I've got a big list here of tools. You don't need all of them, okay? Uh, but I'm gonna go through the list and then I'll suggest ones if you are a new pruner, um, ones that are gonna be super easy to get and help you prune your, your fruit trees. Um, all the pruner, you're really, you are only as good as your tools, okay? So if we're using hand pruners, we're gonna use a bypass pruner. We've got anvil pruners, 
Okay, um, forged or constructed, either are great. Um, the ratchets really come in handy. Um, when you're talking about a lopper, uh, they're quite large, right? We're thinking that uh, a lot of times folks will call a lopper uh, a bypass pruner or a, a long handled bypass pruner, a lopper, okay? You can get some that can telescope. Um, so you, when you're thinking about what you want, you really got to think about how tall your trees are. What is, um, how much can you can sustain holding something that's heavy? Okay. Um, do you need a lighter tool? They do make uh, these pruning tools out of very light materials nowadays. So um, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, you can get tools that look like they're quite heavy, but again, they're made out of materials that are very, very light. Um, a pruning saw. Do you have fruit trees that are quite tall and um, even on say a six foot ladder they're still these branches are still quite far away pruning saws come in handy and also the pole saws come in very handy on um, pole saws as well so both of those things are super super useful um, this is a great example of the bypass versus the anvil bypass pruners you're going to use on material, uh, brown material that is not dead, okay? Um, the bypass pruner is, is great for that soft living material, okay? The anvil pruner, it, it is great for the dead branches, the harder to get branches that you're trying to get off. Um, it's, really, it's really meant to grip grip and get that dead hardwood out of there. And so if you see this, um, the two pictures here, we've got the anvil blade, it comes to a nice point, okay? Very effective on dead hardwood. Um, the bypass uh, blade, it is at a circular, it's very, uh, it's kind of at an angle, a little bit rounded, very effective of do, uh, to make those clean cuts uh, on, the, on the living material. Okay, um, the anvil also has a little notch at the end. Okay, so it doesn't, we've got our, the teeth are here. It doesn't actually, uh, the, the blade doesn't actually go to the end. Okay, pretend this is the end here. Um, it doesn't actually go all the way to the end. It comes in a little bit. So if you're using this, using uh, an anvil pruner on uh, live material, um, Often what happens is, is that you'll get a little, a hang, I like to call them wood hangnails or bark hangnails. And so it's not a very clean cut, but anvil is absolutely super, super effective on dead hardwood. Okay, they're just designed, designed to cut the blades, to, to cut in different ways. Um, the, the anvil really is an up and down and uh, the bypass is more at an angle for that, that uh, pruning the live material, so. Uh, Jenny, I have a quick question here before you go too far past the anvil and the bypass. Yeah. Is there a hybrid? Like, like if getting tools isn't always an, uh, affordable for me and my family. So is, is there something like a hybrid that I could find in that capacity? There is not a hybrid, but if you can only, if you can only come by one of them, okay, um, I would go with the bypass and really focus, because even if it is dead material, it's gonna be harder to cut through and you're gonna to have to uh, think about a smaller dynam diameter of a branch to cut, but you can still get those little dead uh, branches out of there and the dead material out of there and continue to cut your um, live material with a nice clean angled cut. So getting that bypass, yeah, that'll, that'll be super helpful. Um, some really cool tools here. So this is a ratcheted lopper. So this has got the bypass pruner head um, and it, it ratchets. Uh, it's really awesome. And it's telescoping. That means the handles are get uh, longer and shorter depending on your need. Um, they tend to be um, a little bit heavier on the far end because of that ratchet. Um, but you don't need like super muscle power with that ratchet to, to do those branches. And, and most of the time you're able to get up to a, a one and a half, sometimes one and three quarter diameter branch. Um, if you're really lucky, a two inch, if you're really working it, <laughs> ratcheting that up. Um, but I really like the telescoping a lot um, because you can um, you can really adjust it for the, uh, the, the, the distance that you are away from your, your branch that you're cutting. Now, 
when you are cutting, um, you are going to want to make sure that you have your the head of your tool is going to be farther away and at a lower angle. You don't want to go right up like this because that becomes um, a hazard to you. It also makes it it's extremely more difficult to trim or cut that branch. So anytime you're using a long handled lopper, this ratcheted telescoping tool, um, we have the uh, the pole pruner pull saw um, combo there again you're going to use it at an angle so you get that leverage you're using a gravity in that as well okay so you really want that it works great go ahead um, thanks i have a question in the q a from kathy r what's the best tool to prune mini dwarf 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 trees excuse me <laughs> there's there's uh it sounds like it's a, is it a mini dwarf like, yeah, <laughs> mini dwarf, yeah. Um, I, I would again use that bypass pruner. Use the bypass pruner. You can also get what are, um, they're shears, they're hand shears, and they're, they're, they've got uh, tight points. A lot of times they're used for pruning roses. Um, so those, those small pointed, more delicately, you need to really delicately maneuver um, because I know those branches are really small and the, the plants are, themselves are quite small. Um, you could always use those, uh, those, those very small tipped, uh, fine tipped um, pruning tool. Kind of looks like a sewing scissors almost, um, but they have more gusto. <laughs> yeah, a little more, yeah. yeah um, thanks yeah. for that. Uh, just a heads up, everyone else who's asked a few questions, we will get to them when they come up. I'm going to try to make them timely so they fit what uh, what Jenny's talking about. So you will get answered. Don't worry. Thanks for participating. Cool. Um, and then one of the things I really love to have. So if you have you have your arsenal, right? Your basic arsenal of tools. Your bypass pruner. Okay. Um, you. The other thing that I really recommend getting is the handsaw. I love my handsaw. Okay, so it doesn't matter how big the branch is, right? You don't need that anvil. You you don't need the the giant, you know, saws or anything like that. That those those handsaws come in handy in so many different situations. So you are going to use that handsaw. Um, you, I mean, you could do you know branches that are three inches in diameter. You can do with that handsaw. Those teeth are super sharp. I have. Uh, <laughs> injured myself on accident uh, with, the, with that tool. Um, it's very, very sharp. And what's great about um, those is that uh, they last forever. Mine mine is as at least 15 years old. I love it. Um, it is a Corona, the one that's featured, but any of those hand saws will work great. Excellent. And some of um, them have wonderful handles, so they're quite phenomenal. Sounds like you need a first aid kit too. That would be important to have. <laughs> and handy. gloves, right? Um, I do have a follow-up, which is the, this is from Gabrielle M, which is the best for really crowded mature branches? And then there's a couple other questions about when and what type, how to prune, but we'll get to those in a bit, so. Yeah, yeah, so if they're super crowded, again, your hand bypass pruner. Um, this guy right down here, he's got the green handle. Um, if there's, if you notice that there's a lot of dead material, uh, go straight to the anvil, the anvil pruner right here. Okay, it's going to be more effective in getting that dead material out of there, no matter how compact. Um, if the branches tend, if the branches are more than say a half inch in diameter, um, the hand bypass pruner is just not gonna cut it. And you're gonna wanna go to the lopper, which is the long handle, but it, the, the loppers, tend to handle more of an up to an inch and a quarter, sometimes an inch to a three fourths. An um, inch and a quarter seems to be the range um, in diameter of a branch. So start with your bypass pruner. And then as you notice um, larger or, or more dead spots, um, switch up those materials. Yeah. Um, and again, once you get to the larger, larger branches, larger, larger diameter, again, the, the hand saws are fantastic. They're really great. Um, and you can get them for like 20 bucks. Um, sometimes, right now, actually, there's tons of places who are having um, gardening sales. January and February are their garden sales season. So um, you can get your tools easy and cheap. Um, when you're looking at the pole saws and pole pruners, you can see that this one has a detachable saw, okay? Really make sure you get one that has a detachable saw because if you don't need that saw, 
you can just take it right off, use your tools, take that thing right off there, and then just use that pull pruner um, attachment. Um, because the saw, especially if you have very dense branches, um, the saw can get in the way and it can do damage to the tree, not only uh, to the tree, but also damage the, the tool head as well, uh, bending and, and things like that. So. Excellent. Uh, so people are asking about the brand of hand saw if you're in it. I, I don't really have a preference with mine. It's whatever I can afford it that day. Yes. But, uh, yeah. I, I imagine you, if you have the Jenny's gardening sphere, garden sphere brand, that would be your preferred. Oh my God. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I have a Corona and it works great. Again, I've had it for like 15 years. I love it. Um, but any, any of them are, uh, are going to work just fine. Um, there's so many out there. Actually, there's one I'm eyeballing right now, and it's got this beautiful green handle, and, and the handle is very robust, but it's got such a shape to it that I feel like I could use it all day long. Um, but again, it's a lot wider. So you got to think about how you're storing your tools too. Um, I really like this Corona because I can stick it in my back pocket. And it's only, it's only maybe, I would say maybe 12 inches long once it's folded. Um, and it fits in my back pocket beautifully. So I can just keep that always in my back pocket and then I keep my other tools in my other pocket. So uh, just think about what fits for you and what you need. I guess that's that's my advice. <laughs> go, go with works for you, for your body and for you know what, what your plants, you know, what kind of needs you need there too. Get some alcohol. I know we all have so much because of this pandemic. We've been using hand sanitizer and everything else, but um, 91 is great. Um, alcohol cleaning in between your prunings, also cleaning your tools before and after you use them is super important. Um, I, you know what I do? I just put, um, I get a little, um, an old uh, pill bottle. I put cotton balls inside and then I put the alcohol in there. And so I can just keep that little, that little container with me while I'm out and it works great. Um, and then I just use the cotton ball and in between my uh, plants, not between prunings on a plant, but just in between plants themselves, in between trees themselves, um, I always clean my tool. It really helps uh, with cross contamination. Say if one tree has a, a bark disease or um, a fungus, um, it's not gonna be transferred to the next tree that you're cutting into. Okay, so cleaning that tool in between and a really that, that getting that a small uh, used medicine bottle with a lid or anything with a lid, something small you can stick in your pocket with a cotton ball or a couple cotton balls and some alcohol in there. Super easy out in the field that way you don't have to carry around a bottle. <laughs> All right, we're ready for a nice poll. All right, here we go. This one's oddly enough related to pruning tools. So hey. have you used pruning tools before? Now, in the chat, we've talked about spending all our tax refunds, uh, for, for me, for decades on tools. Yes. Uh, folding saws are great, helping clear down. Um, I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer this. Um, let's see, there is one question. Let's see. Well, we'll get to the, like, different specific, like, kiwi and dead. Uh, when is a good time to, or, sorry, how do we tell dead material from the good stuff? That's, oh, the, that's yeah. one of the questions out yeah. there. So. We'll, we'll get that too in a little bit. But it's, well, it's so. totally, yeah, you, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> let's see, we've got about 70% voted. So let's get a few more answers in here and then we will end the poll in about 10 seconds. Yeah, everyone's really participating well. Thank you, everybody. We're gonna try to keep up and we'll get those questions. Excellent. All right, here we go. Let's look at these results. Looks like, you know, pruning. Yes, pruning shears, but not sure if they're the right ones. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, thanks. Oop. Okay. All right. So proper ways to cut. This might answer some of some of those questions about cutting. Um, please, please, please make sure you have sharp tools. Um, January. So the, the late fall and into that early winter months, it really is a great time to take inventory of your tools and see if any of them need oiling, if they need sharpening, um, if you have to replace any of the springs, um, really do some inventory and some cleanup on your tools. Every time you go out, you're gonna wanna make sure you have sharp tools. Dull tools cause injuries, sharp tools, 
will do the job properly and not cause as many injuries. <laughs> I say that because I've, I've, cho- I've, I've cut through my finger when I was holding something before. So it's, it happens even with sharp tools, but at least it's a clean cut. Um, and that's really the purpose. You, you want clean, smooth cuts that are quick. You want to be able to hold your tool, have that spring work properly. You grab it, you, you clench, it cuts, release. You want it to be quick and smooth. Okay. Um, when you're cutting, so you've got sharp tools, they're oiled, they're ready to go, they're clean, they've been disinfected, and we're ready to do quick, clean, smooth cuts. Um, you're going to cut about an eighth to a fourth an inch above that bud at an angle away from the bud. Okay. So I really love uh, my the photo I have down there. It's It's got, you know, uh, cut too high from the bud. The correct angle is just too high. It's just too high. Um, you're encouraging, when you cut too high like that, you're encouraging um, baby suckers to come out there. You know, you're encouraging other other growth and energy loss. Um, the second picture uh, is, is a wrong, a cut in the wrong slope. Okay. And then, uh, so it's going towards the bud instead of away from the bud. We always want to cut away from the bud. Um, too close to the bud. That bud there is going to get bud rot. It won't bloom, won't produce leaves, won't produce flowers. And what you want is fruit. Um, and so that's kind of a dud. Um, the cut on on this one here is it's cut, too, uh, it's too slope. That's a, too much of an angle. Okay, too much of an angle. Again, that tip there is most likely going to end up getting damaged in some way and it's going to affect that bud this cut here is too rough this is what i was calling about a bark hangnail okay it's that it's that little tongue off of there and and that's not a clean cut that tells me that the tool um is the wrong it might be the wrong tool it might be an anvil instead of a, a bypass um it maybe wasn't sharp enough or the branch wasn't placed far enough back in the tool's mouth. So if I have my tool, I want to place my branch kind of midway to back, mid to back. You don't want to you you don't want to cut close to that front edge. You want to do mid to back. That's where you're going to get your best cut and the most leverage. Um, and that last picture there is a correct cut. We've got about uh, about a quarter inch away from that bud, sloping away from the, the bud. That's perfect. Okay, um, the one that says it's too sloping, the, the surface area of that cut is also larger than the correct cut. Okay, so what we're trying to do is do a nice clean cut that's just slightly away from that bud to protect the bud itself, but we're not expending energy that might um, produce um, some suckers and um, we're reducing that surface area that is exposed. Okay, for about 45 degree angle, right? You want to cut and um, just a little bit above that bud. Larger cuts, you're going to go downward away from the collar. Now, I really like this picture because we've got the branch here. Collars are pretty distinct. It rougher out of the branch, you're going to see a very rough edge. That's the collar there, okay? When you have a very large branch that you're cutting out, um, you want to leave that collar. You can see it's sloped again away from the trunk and the collar is left intact. That collar is going to be that tree's band-aid. That collar is going to grow over this exposed area and heal the tree. Okay, think of it as a, a scab, a, a scab going over that exposed area. So we do not want to cut that collar off because that collar is going to help heal that exposed space. Okay. Now, when we're pruning, um, when uh, if you have just planted a tree, right? So the tree has been in the ground. You planted it. You waited a year. Wait a second year. Now you in this wait another year. third year cut it and you're going to cut that 50 percent back okay and this is if it's a new tree planted okay not not a not a, a hearty old apple tree that's been there for 50 years you know this is a new one 
Okay, this is a new tree. So if you are planting trees, um, you really wanna leave them alone and then prune it in that third year. I know it's tough because they look like a ratty teenager with their branches all catawampus and they, you know, they look real ragged and rough. Um, but what's happening there is that it is developing a deep root system and expanding that root system, going deeper, developing that, uh, that, that base at the trunk, um, it's really developing into itself. So those are those toddler years, right? So toddler, elementary years, and then we get, um, you know, then that at the end of that second year, their, their branches are looking a little crazy. Maybe they're in junior high, if you want to have an equivo equivocal uh, <laughs> example, their hair is a little messed up. And then we get to be the senior in high school and we cut it 50% 50, 50 back. Um, the reason we do that is that, A, you're going to start shaping the tree. Um, you're going to have to figure out where the leader is because it's been in the ground a couple of years, right? And so if you would like to have the central leader, in this case, um, uh, you would keep uh, you would keep this branch here if you wanted to do central leader, leader right? Keep that. Uh, this going. Um, this is going to be pruned back in the shape of the uh, the Y, the vase. Okay, so it, it, you know, assuming I'm going to make an assumption that you know, hey, a, a, a open vase, apple, apple or pear, right? And so um, it's cut back, so it's got this really nice open space here. Um, we call the main branches off of fruit trees scaffolds. So this has some really nice scaffolds. Um, it has some new potential scaffolds here. And what you're looking for is balance. I know it might feel really weird to have to cut back 50% of the tree on that third year because you're thinking, oh, it's looking gorgeous and it produced a couple apples that I just can't, ah. Just do it, take a deep breath, cut it back. You are gonna have so much more healthy tree um, by doing that uh, and doing this early on in its, in its life in your yard. And this really is, is for the new trees, okay? And we do wanna leave these, these little branches at the bottom because this tree is gonna grow up and these are gonna become new scaffolds that are gonna produce fruit, okay? They look ratty and tiny like little, little arms coming off here, but leave them for a couple years and those are gonna become new scaffolds that are gonna produce fruit. Now, we'll, we'll get to the folks uh, who have older trees because that, they, that is a different beast altogether, right? And so this is if your tree is established, right? You're not doing that, that initial 50% cutback. Okay, so this is where you're gonna develop structure. Here are the three Ds, diseased, damaged, dead. Always prune those out. Dead, diseased, damaged, okay? That's where your anvil pruner comes in super handy because the, that wood is in general gonna be a little bit harder. Um, it's not gonna be that, that tender soft stuff, okay? Um, what you're doing is you're creating space. Um, you are gonna now get your bypass pruner. You've got your dead, your diseased, your damaged out of there with that anvil pruner grab your bypass pruner. Now we're gonna start getting out those suckers. We're gonna get out branches that are crossing or rubbing each other, okay? We are gonna get out the water sprouts, which are at the base of the tree. They come straight up at bases of trees. Um, th those are gonna take nutrients away from your tree. Um, you're gonna wanna get down in and, and cut them as low as you can go. Uh, removing any branches that are facing down, Hey, you don't want to, you don't want your tree going downward. That just starts bad habits for your tree and can do a lot of damage in the future. Um, any branches that are going into the trunk. So pretend my, my head is the trunk and my branches are coming in this way. Get rid of those because we're looking for outward movement. Okay, outward movement. Okay. Remove the suckers. Suckers are ones that are coming off the main scaffolds on the tree up above and they are straight up most of the time sometimes if you if, if you it's an older tree and there have been cuts already they come off suckers do come off of those those old cuts okay so you have to cut all those back and then you're getting rid of weak branches um branches that they're just kind of flimsy they really they're not a really strong scaffold okay 
So here we have the branches crossing and you can see how this branch goes across here. One of the reasons I would remove this branch right here, A, the diameter is very small. Okay, in comparison to this one and this one here, that scaffold is, is small. The scaffold is also too close to this branch. Okay, they're too close together. You want at least a good 18 inches between scaffolds if it's a regular tree, say a semi-dwarf. Um, if it is a, dwar a dwarf or a mini dwarf, at least 12 inches between those, those scaffolds, um, if not 15, if you can pull it off. Um, and, and I would get rid of this because this is starting to encroach on this branch. It's gonna rub it. It's going to do bark damage, which then encourages disease. So you wanna get rid of that. That's the one I would get rid of. I wouldn't get rid of this larger branch. I would get rid of this small branch right here. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, uh, in addition to that, so you mentioned the, the triple Ds, diseased, mm -hmm. damaged, and dead. One yeah. of the questions was, um, when is, you know, how to tell dead material from good stuff? You kind of went into that, like the hardness of it and whatnot. Could you uh, reiterate a little? Yeah, so you can always test it out. Um, you know, just test out a few branches if you're, if you're feeling unsure. Um, but the dead branches, the smaller ones, you may be able to just break off and then you're going to do a clean cut at the base because they're going to be very, the smaller ones tend to be more brittle. The larger ones are going to be very hard. If you look at the, when you've done your cut and you look on the inside, you're going to see a very dark material on the inside of that branch. Okay. Um, if it is live, it should be a kind of a light yellow color with a green outline. And then you've got your bark. Okay, so it should be very tender too. You should be able to stick your thumbnail in it and, and press into that branch. It, it, same thing on the outside of the branch. So you should be able to press your nail into it a little bit. Okay, get it in there. I mean, if it's an old tree, it's gonna be tough, but you can tell, you can scrape a little of the bark away and you'll either see green, right? That green, fresh, live material, or you are just gonna be injuring your nail and it'll be, it really, the larger branches really are hard. I mean, they just turn solid. Um, so yeah, it's, it, once you're out there and in it, you can really tell like, <laughs> and, and this one's alive, you know? The live ones also are very pliable. Okay, the, the, living, the living branches, the ones that are alive, that you can, you can kind of, you can give them a little pull here and there, you know? Um, even on the old trees, you can, they're a little bit pliable, but the dead branches, the dead branches, I mean, they're not moving. If you don't break them by pulling on them, they're just, they're just gonna be really stiff, so. Excellent, thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out that these are the suckers. This is first year suckers. Every year you're gonna have suckers, every year. <laughs> That's why annual pruning is so important. And then these are the water sprouts. Okay. What do you leave? So it's really important that you have a leader of some sort if you're going for that central leader, okay? So in this diagram here, you can see that there are two branches vying for central leader for that, that the, the, the central, um, trunk line that is going to keep that tree balanced um you're gonna again you're cutting this part off it's going at an angle this leader here is nice and straight and tall and reaching for the sky so that's why you would leave that um, i love this picture here because it really shows how you can um cut out branches you're pruning the tree and it really is a great comparison of the before and after because you can see the airflow, right? You can see, see that now air is gonna circulate in that space. The, the fungus are gonna have a harder time. The molds and mildews are gonna have a harder time. Um, airflow, heat, um, you're gonna have less rot, um, less blossom rot, a lot of things happen there. Um, and it also makes it easier when you're caring for your, uh, your trees using pest management. Um, so the scaffolds, you do wanna have them at a roughly a 60, 45 to 60 degrees is always good for a scaffold. Um, you can see how the elbow in here is very tight. Um, all kinds of bacteria, fungus, uh, disease is gonna form in that elbow. And eventually um, you'll have some issues with that branch. It also encourages it to go straight up rather than out and over. So you want that fruit 
more accessible, um, you want more balance. This also doesn't give balance to the, the tree. Um, having these scaffolds at this angle really helps keep that tree balanced. When that heavy fruit is on there, it doesn't fall over, okay? So you want it, you want it to stay nice and balanced when that fruit's on there. So having, having scaffolds at the correct, um, or at least, you know, in the gist area of 45 to 60 degrees, it's really important, especially when fruit is set. Spurs, I love spurs. I think they look like little witch's fingers. Um, they are where your leaves, your flowers, your fruit, that's where everything's happening. Now, they are gonna look very different than your uh, suckers, okay? They really are significantly different. So I'm gonna go back really quick to the suckers. Do you see how the suckers, um, this one's a real shorty, but it doesn't have a bud here, right? No bud. And, and these have little side shoots, it's probably gonna produce some leaves, but it's no real prominent bud. If I go back here, you can see that this has a very prominent bud on the end. Now, when you're, when you're looking at spurs, some are gonna be short, some are gonna be long, but you're always gonna have that super prominent bud on the end. And that's what you're looking for. And you wanna leave as many spurs as you can uh, because then it's gonna flower and then you get pollination and then you can deal with the fruit and balance later. Excellent. You did go back as a uh, screen. And one of the questions was now um, sprouts or water sprouts, right? Come from the ground. Correct. And then the other ones come from the tree at branch, like the, the trunk it's, or the itself. So those are, that's the distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You have one, um, and, and really you could call them all suckers if you just want to put a blanket over them. They're all suckers. They're all, and, and the reason they're called suckers is because they're sucking nutrients and energy from the tree and away from producing fruit effectively. You get more disease. So it's just really they're suckers. They're like vampires for the, <laughs> for the fruit. Right. Um, and, and the ones at the bottom at the base are coming from the root system. And so you just, you want to cut them as low as you can. Um, and then the ones in the branches, um, you just cut them all the way off as close as you can to that main branch. So. And spurs kind of look like the little uh, budding antlers on our deer, right? When they're that, then they yeah. have the velvety going on. They just a little yeah. like nubs, right? Yeah. So yeah, like this one's got two, it's got one here and then it's got a longer yeah. one here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, I don't know, they're cute. <laughs> Cute spurs. <laughs> so when you're thinking about, uh, this is really good for um, trees that are super established. Okay, so you're older fruit trees, heading back. Heading back is even important for those um, older trees. So heading back is when you're just removing about 20% of the, of the tree matter, you're bringing it in a little bit, right? You've cut out all of your suckers. You've cut out all of the damaged, diseased, um, you know, all of that stuff. You got it all done. And now we're just bringing it in a little bit, okay? Maybe the tree has just gotten a little bit too tall to handle. Um, maybe you just want more accessibility. Heading off is always okay. Heading off just means you're bringing it in um, to make it a little bit more accessible. It also keeps it growing a little bit lower. A lot of times what you'll see is you'll see apple trees, especially um, in people's yards right now. Um, if they've done their pruning, there's just these, arms coming off of the main trunk and they 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 prune it pretty heavily but again those trees are going to end up pretty they left the spurs and then it, it, every year they look absolutely gorgeous so um don't be afraid to head it back um and that this is when you're kind of looking at aesthetics and shaping um so this this is a before and after of it, to me, it looks maybe like a, a five-year-old tree, um, maybe four or five years old, and um, it's really looking at shaping it up, right? And so it's just cutting these branches back, getting out a few that maybe might overlap, um, finding that central leader, um, kind of figuring out how they're going to shape that up, because that will affect future growth as it gets older. Um, with an with a, with a older tree, it's really all about just bringing it back um, and, and heading those other branches off to make it more accessible, but leaving all the spurs. Now, uh, one question came up, uh, yeah. are, or two, are spurs pointing down okay to leave, and what specifically are spurs, the distinction? And then uh, I have another one. So what happens if you have a main scaffold that is at 30 degree angle, that's as tall as a as a leader. Can I cut it off completely? So those are some specific. That's a specific question. Okay. I think you know. So spurs going down. Totally just leave them. Leave. You want to leave all your spurs. 
<laughs> because you don't know for sure what's going to get pollinated. Okay. We've had a super, this year, we've had a super mild winter. So we might have trees blooming early, but will the pollinators be out early? Because the temperature, even for the pollinators, has to be at about 50 degrees. So you, just, you leave them all on there. Uh, and this is hedging your bets, you know? Uh, the more that flowers, the more that you get all those blooms on there, um, the better chance you're going to get at getting those flowers pollinated. And, and what you're looking for is the fruit. So if they don't get pollinated, you don't have any fruit, and that's a bummer. <laughs> work for no fruit so um so you want to you really want to leave them all on there um spurs i'm going to go back to the other picture so spurs the huge difference with spurs is you're going to notice it, it's that it's that head so if my arm was a spur i've got the the stem and then it really is kind of a a, a bud at the end of that branch and it's not even a branch it's, it's just like a little stem off of the main scaffold okay Ooh. oh uh wrong. Um, you're gonna you're 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 gonna want to just look at them. You're gonna know the difference. And spurs are gonna show up on younger scaffolds and older scaffolds. Um, and if it's an older tree, uh, the branches that it come off of that main scaffold. So you have a main scaffold, and then you have branches just like right here. So you have a main scaffold, and then you have all of the branches that come off of it right here those branches are gonna have um, spurs on them, okay? So you may not have spurs on the main scaffold, which is absolutely normal. And if it's an older tree, likely, um, but on the branches that come off of those scaffolds, you're gonna have spurs. And so you're just gonna leave all of those spurs there. And it, they, they are significant. They really, really look very different from a, a sucker. Suckers are gonna have like this greenish, olivish uh, skin on the outside if it's a if it's new and um it's going to be very tender like you could scratch it and you're like oh it just came off all on my finger <laughs> it's you just gotta get it out of there but the but the 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 spurs most of the spurs are going to have a small little branch that looks very similar to the scaffold coloring it's not going to look the same as as those suckers I hope that answered that question. Um, and then um, again, you just go, when you're heading back, you're just looking for, um, you're supporting the fruit. So you gotta think about balance and support. There was a third question and I can't remember what it was. Yeah, it was about um, what happens if you have a main scaffold that is at a 30 degree angle, that's as tall as a leader. Can you cut it off completely? It depends on the shape of your tree that's already been established. So um, if you already have a leader and that branch is just going crazy and it's up here trying to be the leader, get rid of that branch because A, it's competing, it's not balanced, it's pull, it actually what it's doing over time, it's, it's gonna start pulling the tree that direction because now you have two very strong, um, scaffolds moving in one direction and a whole bunch of disease is going to form in that that elbow okay so you just want to cut it out of there um cut it out of there though look for that um collar and make sure to cut it properly cut away and cut at the collar that's going to be super important and we're here for another poll <laughs> yes and i've promised people while i'm putting the poll question up there i'm going to ask more questions so oh. hang on <laughs> here comes the poll question uh, what is your experience pruning trees? So I'll give you a couple seconds. And so some of the questions people wanted to know, um, well, we talked about the sprouts. Mm -hmm. uh, is pruning of grafting trees different? Let's see, do pruning grafted trees, uh, fruit trees differently? Do you prune grafted fruit trees differently than one that has no grafting? And then oh, uh, I'm in the third year of my five fruit trees planted as bare root trees from Costco. Is it okay to prune? <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Remember, let's do one at a time. <laughs> sorry, sorry, right, I'm sorry. Okay, so, so let's so the, start with the... The first one was the grafted tree. So yes. grafted trees, you have to be very careful. It's inevitable that one of those grafts is going to die. They don't always survive. So just be mindful of that, you know, don't... Just be mindful one of them is absolutely going to die over time. Um, it's just kind of what happens. Um, it, they don't always take successfully, and it takes them about 10 years, and then they start dying off um 
You do need to be careful though, because you don't want to cut off those scaffolds. Those scaffolds are the graft. So you're going to be cutting off the suckers off of the scaffolds and you can head them in a little bit, right? You can head them in and the root stock that it's on, get the water sprouts from that root stock because it's probably going to produce some water sprouts. Okay. Um, but again, you're just taking the suckers, uh, the suckers off heading it in, but don't remove those scaffolds because those have been grafted on specifically. And then if you cut it off, you've just lost one of your varieties. And that's really sad. <laughs> it's all, it's such a delicate balance, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> the next question, and I'm going to stop the polling here. The next question is, I'm in the third year of my five fruit trees planted from bare root trees from Costco. Is it okay to prune those back 50% also? If they're, if they're in their third year, I would just do it. There you go. Otherwise, otherwise you got to wait till next winter. So you could let them run the next one more year. I mean, if you're really busy, don't feel bad about it. You know, you could just, you could just do it next winter. Um, but if you have time, I would just, I would do it now. Yeah. And if they're a plum, if they're a plum, you could wait till August, a plum or a cherry. You can wait till August to do it. Ooh, look at that. Yeah. Played. Let's look at our answers here. Thank you uh, for that. 57% have uh, been pruning, but want to be sure it's right. That's yeah. always good. Even yeah. the professionals, you know, keep training, right? We do. Gotta know what's right. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. There we go. Espeliers. Okay, so this, I don't know. Espeliers are neat. Um, Espeliers are horizontally growing fruit trees. A lot of times you're gonna see apples being grown espelier. Um, in Eastern Washington and Central Washington, they're actually starting to do this in their orchards um, because they can get more trees and more fruit from espelier. Um, it just means that they are moving um, horizontally across like this. Some people use them as a live fencing and they uh, overlap at the ends and they go across like this. Um, this one has been trained to go horizontally and then go up, but they're flat. So they're not gonna be around. They're great for um, small spaces uh, because small spaces often, you know, you don't, you have to think about the whole diameter of the tree and the circumference of the tree. But it's spell, yeah, they're flat. So you can put them anywhere. You can put them right next to a house. You can put them out in the, as a fence line. Um, and maybe as a divider between two homes. Um, they're very cool. They're super thin. Um, Espelias are fantastic. Um, Espelias don't really have a lot of suckers. Um, there is one at the Enviro house. And um, we've been trying, <laughs> Jan and I have been working hard on that one. Um, probably should get out there and then and prune that one up. Um, but you you can shape them the way you want to. Um, you know, this one go, goes out and up. Um, you could go out and then up and then out and up. You could design on these. I don't know, they're really fun, but you do want to leave all the spurs, absolutely every single one of the spurs, um, because that's where, again, you can see here, all the spurs are creating the leaf matter and where your blossoms are going to appear. There's one more, I don't have a picture of it right now. I, I really should add it. Um, it's a columnar. A columnar means they grow straight up in a column. Fantastic for patio gardens, um, for um, uh, folks who maybe live in a condo and you have a, a little a little walk out there, you know, a little deck that you can walk out to. Fantastic because they, they just grow up like this and, and you can really keep them. I mean, if you only want it to get four feet high or six feet high, totally can keep them like that. And they just, they grow just like this, but they grow straight up and all the leaves and the flowers and the fruit all come on this column. Um, sometimes you'll have one column, sometimes you'll have one column and then you'll have a few little off, few little offshoots that go straight up too. Um, but they are super awesome for small spaces. Uh, we had the, uh, is it an Italian cypress that does that? Goes straight up? Yeah. Yeah, we have a couple of those, yeah. I love them. They're great for spa uh, uh, space savers. Yeah, and, and they add privacy as a nice privacy shield. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the apples taste just as good. <laughs> and the pears. They, most of the time you're going to find columnar for apples and pears. Um, and it's yeah. 
or apples and pears. Um, they are coming out with a few cherry espaliers um, because uh, the, uh, the stone fruits grow just a little bit differently. Um, figs. There is a reason why I have figs here. Figs are delicious. They grow very well here in the Pacific Northwest. Figs can take a beating and come back. Uh, figs are very generous trees. Um, so you could, if you know, if it came down to it, I could chop this tree down to about three or four feet high, chop all of it off, and it would still be alive. And it would only take probably two years before it would start producing fruit again on the branches that it has off of those off the shoots that come off that those two stumps. So really, there is there is no way that you can mess up a, a fig. Absolutely none. There is no wrong way or right way to prune these guys. They 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 will shape to your whim. <laughs> So if you have a fig, don't worry about it. Um, Gardens Fair has a giant fig uh, in the front of their building on the corner um, next to our soil yard. And boy, I know I, I've hit that fig with those rolling carts many times over the years, and it just takes a beating. It produces figs that are just delicious. And, um, you know, it's in a part shade space. You know, it doesn't get full sun all day. So figs, you know, you can kind of, you got some wiggle room with figs. Are they uh, deer resistant is a question, uh, the figs? You know, the, oh, the figs themselves, well, if they're low to the ground, those deer are going to eat them. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they'll eat deer resistant trees all day, or plants all day long anyways. I mean, if you find some tasty treats and the deer discovers it and they like it, that's it. But um, I, I worked on a farm and the, the deer only got in there a couple of times. You know who, who he had trouble with? The raccoons. The raccoons would get in there when those figs were ripe and they would just pilfer. <laughs> so, so it really isn't the deer, it's the raccoons with the figs. They think they're fantastic. Um, I do have this up here for a reason. Um, if you have tree wound sealer and any kind of a tree cutting sealer, please throw it away. Don't buy it. Um, the tree itself has its own mechanism of healing and it will put out um, sap it needs to do the initial sealing. It will heal itself um, all by itself and it will do a better job um, and on top of that uh, that sap that goes on top of those wounds has an antibacterial effect and so it really is a, uh, leaving nature to nature on this one is is, is a best bet uh, because what you're doing with the tree wound is you're painting in whatever just landed on that that wound depending on how long it's been since uh, it's been cut you're painting in anything there's no antibacterial um, component to that um, so you know it can do it can do damage down the line to your your fruit trees um, so I always like to mention that just let the tree heal itself now if you have a branch that is just catawampus you got a young tree and you're like you know what i bet i can make that that branch go out a little bit farther that scaffold is going to be a good one but i gotta i gotta bring it down i gotta get that that angle a little bit bigger um there are lots of ways you can encourage growth and encourage them to spread out over time so here are some things that you can use you can use the the actual the, the branch spreader um you can use a a uh, a pin there, you know, you got our, your clothes pin, uh, and then weights, you know, very, of course, gentle weights to stimulate that growth. Um, you don't want anything too heavy. You just want it weighted enough so the, the branch feels a little bit of pressure to then start encouraging that growth to go that way. It, it is possible. It does, it does work. You have to be very patient. It's going to take a couple of years, but you can encourage that growth. It's a super easy way to do it too. Um, so here are some next steps, um, and then I will uh, next Saturday uh, we'll be going over um, fruit tree care, and uh, so uh, you can join us then for in more depth all about fruit tree care, um, but and selection, um, but uh, just as a wonderful little list here that can help you out. Um, some some things you could be thinking about getting, um, you know, uh, lime sulfur, horticultural oils, fruit tree sprays, um, all of course get ones that are um, 
use with natural derivatives. Um, I personally really like to use neem oil. Um, I do, I, my, you know, my mom and I, we spray all of our fruit trees after, after we've pruned, you don't want to waste that, uh, waste that, uh, the, those oils and sprays. Um, so you do it after you've pruned and I do it, it right before I prune. I mean, after I prune, I, spr I give all of them a good spray. Okay. And this is just being proactive. Uh, and then, you know, they blossom after they've set fruit. I give them another spray. And then about midsummer, I give them another spray with the neem oil. It really cuts down uh, pest activity. Um, if you have apples and pears, you're going to want to invest in some apple maggot traps and um, some coddling moth traps as well. Um, I've used the booties. They're very effective. They're like little nylons, like you're putting nylons on apples, you know, they're getting ready to go out uh, on the town. Um, this uh, deer spray is very effective. You do have to reapply it um, a couple of times. Um, you know, but it, it is effective in the long run. Um, protecting that trunk area, if you do use the hardware cloth or PVC pipe, make sure that you are checking it every six months because that growth will happen and you don't want to strangle the growth of your tree. So you really, every six months, if you're going to put a protective barrier around your trunk and then thinking about mason bees for pollination. <laughs> uh, someone is addressing, asking the question, uh, aphids. Best yeah. way to get rid of aphids. I know ladybugs work when they're when they stick around, right? The larvae. It's it's, oh, it's okay. The little baby dragons. Yeah, that they're the best. You know, it's when they lay when the ladybugs stay, they lay eggs, and then you get the benefit from it. Um, aphids on fruit trees don't tend to be a huge issue. Um, elderberry can have aphid infestations, but it does not affect the fruit. And a lot of times what you're gonna have is the ants will farm the aphids. So the ants keep them in control pretty well. Um, Try to think what else. A lot of things that you might encounter um, will be uh, leaf curl. Um, you might have, uh, which then you would use copper for that. Uh, there, there's a, a couple other things. Aphids don't seem to hit uh, fruit trees nearly as hard as say they hit our brassicas, which are our, our broccolis, cabbages, kales, things like that, uh, Brussels sprouts, um, our annual plants. They hit, I know aphids hit annual plants quite hard, um, but the fruit trees, you've got other stuff going on. So I wouldn't worry too much about the aphids, but again, if, you, if, you had, if you're proactive and you're doing you know, the fruit tree spray or you're using the horticultural oil or the neem oil um, and you're kind of doing it periodically, you, know, you shouldn't have uh, that issue. Should be reduced, your pest, pest reduction will, will be great. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. And the next poll. Huzzah, the poll. Which fruit trees do you have or want to have? Answer now. Um, I will ask one of the questions. Um, oh, do you prune columnar trees? Yes, to get the sucker. Yeah. You'll get a few, not many. The, 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 the care for the columnar is so, so reduced. <laughs> So you're just getting out the suckers. And if you have any dead stuff, you want to get that out, but way easier than your standard, say, semi-dwarf. And we do have a, a slew of questions and I'll try one more here. Cool. Um, I have an apple tree with seven types of apples that I want to cut back about 50% this year. It's mm -hmm. about eight years old. Would this be okay to cut back now? Yes. If you're going to yes. do it, prune now. Prune it now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, okay, let's look at the poll questions. The replies, here we go. Oh, apples, pears, Asian pear, kiwi. Yeah. We do have a question about a kiwi. Oh, that's right, uh, yeah. Let's see if I can find it. it. I think it was. Pruning kiwi, I thought. Or... Yeah, it was about. Uh, I may have lost it. Now, for I'll those, find it. Yeah. For those of you getting the stone fruit, nectarines and peaches are rough. Okay, so you're just gonna have to be super patient if you're getting nectarines or peaches. Um, there are, there is good news though. Uh, there are some really fantastic Pacific Northwest friendly um, 
peaches and nectarines. Um, and uh, the WSU Extension Farms and Research and OSU, um, Oregon State University, they have been just researching like mad, um, trying to get the Pacific Northwest more varieties. So keep your eyes out for Pacific Northwest friendly. Um, you, you don't want to get varieties that grow well in Yakima. Okay, we don't have the heat. It's not dry enough. We're too wet. They will be very upset. <laughs> uh, yeah, different rough. weather here than yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be rough. It'll be rough. And then you're going to be like, but why did I only get one? And it's like, oh, because we had all this rain or we just <laughs> had heat. You know, it didn't it, we didn't have ninety? You know, ninety degrees or eighty five degrees consistently for three weeks. You know, or so yeah, just. Uh, the the that. question about kiwis was i got my first kiwis this year when and how much should i prune my kiwi vines and then about pruning fuzzy kiwi if there's time so fuzzy kiwi. so uh so they uh purchased them this year or they've been in the ground for one year uh this year uh i got my first kiwis this year three when and how much should i prune the kiwis so i'm i'm thinking maybe they just got three kiwi oh, okay so yeah you're not going to do anything to them you oh, are... first time they fruited. Sorry, they followed up. First time they fruited. Okay, first time to prune them. Okay, so um, kiwi, like, uh, so kiwi and grapes, um, some of the second year uh, cane fruit, um, you have to deal with them a little bit differently. So um, you're going to want, with the kiwi, you are going to want to cut out dead material, any dead material. Okay, you'll know it's dead. You'll feel it. It's, it's brittle. Um, it, it, it will break off. It's dark. It's really dark. Um, you are going to want to cut back your kiwi vines so that you have at least eight to 12 buds on that vine left. Eight being the minimum. Okay, so. I wouldn't, it's not an apple tree or a pear tree, a palm or a stone, okay? So you're not gonna cut it back 50%. Kiwi is very different because it's a vining plant, um, like a grape. And so you have to really treat it differently. So so again, leaving, you're gonna see the, the new buds on your vines, okay? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna leave at least eight, leave up to about 12 or 15 and then cut it back from there okay um, you're also going to want to tie them up to whatever they're growing on okay you may need to reposition vines so that they're um th so that the air flow is better okay um but you you don't want to cut 50 percent, especially if you have a short vine and you don't even have eight you're not going to cut that at all you're going to let that continue out Okay, it's it's I know it's tricky because um, uh, I know it's kiwi 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 and with grapes a lot of times new fruit comes on that second year growth so you're 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 really going to want to gauge it about how many buds you have because that becomes really crucial with a vine um, with a vining fruit. Do we have Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any I more? Questions. Yeah, we have a lot more questions, but if you want to, let's get through this and we'll get to the Here's next poll and then let's see what we can yeah, come up with. This is my last slide. So oh, perfect. I think we talk about the city of Tacoma next. So. There we go. So, yeah, have you participated in the city of Tacoma Power Tree coupon program? Um, I have a picture of it, but I'll have to show that in a bit. Yeah, we are, um, there are a lot of questions. Uh, do aphids cause leaf curl because the person who asked about aphids sees that also no it's a whole no. different thing yeah it's a it's a rust a lot of times it's a rust or it's a fungus okay leaf curl, is, leaf curl is treated with a copper spray copper spray and then um are there any fruit tree sprays that you recommend copper spray and neem is an oil Neem is fantastic. Um, the horticultural oil works great because it's a, basically it works as a coating, but the neem also has um, that calendula um, component to it. So um, I, I particularly like neem. I have had lots of success. Um, the year that my mom were like on top of the apples. <laughs> <laughs> 
like we were on it um and we did everything we did the booties we did we, we were just we had a really great season and the apples you could tell you could tell it was like all the work totally paid off our apples didn't have um maggots that had gone through them um we didn't have any coddling moth i um i used the um coddling moth, moth traps you can open them up and actually look at see how many you're getting for how many what the date is and you can see where their breeding cycle is that went down um so i think just creating a, a calendar like put it on the calendar i'm going to do this this day i'm going to do this you know this month and this month and creating that for yourself um that's super helpful yeah and i, I the name is been great for, for me. So, and we also use a diatomaceous earth at the base of our trees and on the trunks of the trees, uh, because what that does is once those, um, any kind of insects or uh, pests that decide to crawl up, um, then they get small lacerations, they get dehydrated and they die. Um, so it's, um, and it's pet safe. Diatomaceous earth is pet safe. Um, it's nature safe. So it's not going to hurt any anyone except for the little insects that get the lacerations. Um, and they then cannot lay eggs up in the canopy of the tree. Um, so we put diatomaceous earth at the base and on the trunk. Um, spray with neem. Diatomaceous after the neem. Because <laughs> otherwise you have to put it on again because you've just sprayed it. No way. Helpful tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it looks like uh, many people need have not participated in the Tacoma um, tree program and tree coupon program. And again, I'll show that graphic here in a little bit. Um, I would like to try to get through some of these, a lot of these questions. If we have till 12, if you're available, right, Jenny? Right. I'm Excellent. totally here. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we okay. can see yeah. everything. So Great. I'll just start at the top of my Q&A and then I'll go back. So how do you prune cherry trees? Uh, sorry, prune bush cherries, excuse me, bush cherries. Uh, bush cherries are, you want to prune them more like a landscape plant. I know that doesn't give you, <laughs> it's more about aesthetics and getting the dead, diseased and damaged. Really with the, with the bush, you get to get the dead, diseased and damaged and, and just doing a heading in. They don't have a lot of, a lot of suckers to deal with like you do with the, the trees. Sure. Um, okay, uh, there was a question. Can I check in on that a minute? The um, landscape tree pruning workshop is February 27th, and we can check with John McCulloch and see if he can include something on that. He yeah. usually does the bigger landscape trees, but he will be covering the differences between landscape tree pruning and fruit tree pruning. So. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one person asked if trees are living, do they feel it when we prune? So big, deep philosophical question, but I thought, you know, hey, it's fair to ask. Also, the same person wanted to know, uh, are tree spurs similar to bone spurs? Going for, a, I think, a little bit of a joke there, but that's okay. I think. <laughs> well, benef spurs, beneficial spurs, not the ones that hurt, because it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Um, and that, the other question is very existential, very existential. I don't know, um, but that's why we try to make it smooth and quick. <laughs> that's right. Just take care of it, and then it grows. It grows back, right? Yeah. They have that. Yep. And keeping the surface area very small, right. so it doesn't have a lot of surface area to try to heal over. So. Excellent. Uh, I've read mixed answers to when is the right time to prune a tree. Can you give a good explanation as to when the healthiest time is to prune? Now you said I think this time of year right now is the best yeah. time. So. Fruit trees in particular, January, February are the best time to prune them. Okay, and it's because they're dormant. That's why. Uh, because all of their sap, everything has gone into the trunk and it is gone, all the energy is in the root system. They're not expending extra energy up into the canopy of their tree. So there's not a lot of sugars running. There's, it's a lot safer for the tree. Um, it's able to heal itself a little bit better because then it can pinpoint where those openings are, where the, the open spaces are, and then they can go right to it because they're not expending energy into fruit or leaves or flowers and things like that. So it's because it's dormant. That's why it's the best time to prune. Now, plums and cherries are a little weird. So we've had a lot of success with pruning plums and cherries at the end of August, beginning of September, before it gets cold. Um, and it's a moderate uptick in fruit production. 
So if you want to play with that um, after they've uh, born fruit, um, wait till the end of the summer and prune them then, um, because then they're starting their down cycle. Okay, they're starting to um, they're starting to bring all their sugars back in. Um, you know, it's about September ish. So. So you could give it a shot, but the reason, the real reason why we, we do all the fruit trees is because they're not expending that energy on the fruit and the flower and the leaf right now. And you want, when they're uh, expending their energy on the fruit, you want as much energy going to that fruit as possible. You don't want it to have to spend time to on top of heal itself because it will choose, that tree will choose to heal itself and take energy away from your fruit. So, which is totally makes sense, right? It wants to be healthy. So, um, so when it's dormant, it's best. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, this one the question is, and how do how do you maintain a low profile? Um, I don't imagine that's like walking around like this inconspicuous. Oh. So I imagine that's keeping uh, your trees, uh, you know, lower profile. Oh, that's worded. Um, again, it's all about the pruning. Really, truly, uh, you can train. So say you only got semi dwarf, right? So technically, they're gonna get upwards of fifteen feet tall, right? Semi dwarf. Not a dwarf, they're not standard, they're kind of semi dwarf, kind of those in between. So you can get up to about 15 feet tall, um, but you can prune it and train it to stay lower. Okay, it's all about the training. So if you have the time and the patience and you are set where you just, you're like, no, I want it only six feet tall, and that's how I want my tree to be. You just have to train it. And you may have to use, um, you might have to use some weights on the scaffolds to make them be more horizontal than vertical um, to create more of an L, more of an, maybe an, eight, um, an 80 degree uh, rather than a, a 60 to 40 degree. So it just takes some maneuvering, but you can totally do that. And again, it's all in the pruning. It's really all in the pruning. And I think that also takes training yourself to prune. Yeah. Right. You really, it's that whole combination of it, isn't it? It is. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you don't get out there and do it, then it's not going to learn, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, is it a good time to prune a fig tree that has no leaves right now? Oh, you could prune a fig tree in June. I mean, you just, if you feel compelled to prune your fig tree now, just do it. <laughs> really, fig, the fig won't care. The fig will not care. It's one of those fruit trees where it's just like, whatever, I'm totally relaxed. This is cool, you know. Whatever you want to do, man. That's kind of what the fig says. Excellent. <laughs> Um, question about thinning of fruit. I got a lot of small cherries, but would like to know about thinning so I'll get fewer bigger cherries. I'd like to know about the thinning, the timing of this. So. Yeah, that's a great question. I super encourage you to come to the selection and care class next week. Um, we're gonna go way into stuff like that. Um, but to briefly answer your question, um, you are going to choose when you're thinning and you're thinning cherries in particular um you'll notice that a lot of times cherries come in twos right they're attached they're attached as a double so you're going to look for um for sets of four okay so you're keeping those sets of four together any more than four then you're just gonna it's there's gonna be not enough airflow, you're gonna get some damage in there. Um, water can get trapped in there. Cherries hate it when water touches them. They're just like, oh, um, they start to get rot and um, it, it becomes an issue. But sets of four or we, clusters of four are always really good. Um, and you wanna do it before they start turning. So do it um, just before they start turning, not when they're just small and green, but you do, um, it's almost, it's almost like you start seeing that transition from that green, to then, you know, whether it's a rainy or a yellow blush or a, or the bing or a, or a pie, um, you're going to want to do it when it's almost full size so you can tell the sizes, so you can take the smaller ones out um, and then leave the larger ones. So, but you don't want to do it when they're already too full grown at that. It, it kind of okay. defeats uh, the purpose, but you want to get them when you know, you can kind of tell what's going on there. Yeah, in close yeah. four. Um, this moves on to similar. I have a diseased tree that produces too much fruit. How can I prevent it from producing fruit or at least reduce the fruit? It's an old tree. It's an old tree. So if you want to reduce the fruit, if it sets fruit, take it off. Just take it off. But, I mean, really, truly, it's, it's, it, um, it's the only way that you're going to reduce that load um, 
if it's an old tree and it's been diseased for a while, you might, when you see the blossoms out, you might want to just take all the blossoms off. So it doesn't even, doesn't Sweet even at that point. It doesn't even expend any energy on even setting. Um, I mean, you can leave it up for the pollinators. You know, they get to do their little dance and pollinate stuff. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, just, just taking those off maybe after they've, they've, you know, they've been out a little while, you know, and then we get a good windstorm and then take them all off, you know, <laughs> that'll be your best bet because if, if it is setting fruit and you're having a hard time with, um, pest management, um, it, you, yeah, it, the right thing is just to take all the fruit off, just, just eliminate the fruit altogether and then really work on building up that tree, um, working on pest management. Okay. Uh, we just moved and obtained six to seven plum trees. Will it send them into shock if we cut them back too much? They have, they are covered in moss. Okay. And you've moved, how old are they? Uh, it does not say, but. Okay. So you've moved them. No, they've um, moved and obtained. So I think they moved into some place that had them established. Oh, so. but, the, but the trees themselves have, weren't dug up and then moved. No, no. No. Okay. <laughs> Don't different. believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. No. Um, if they are established trees, you're not going to be cutting them back fifty percent. You could probably take a good thirty percent off that tree, but you're not going to do it fifty percent. Okay. You're going to have to if if they have not been cared for for a very long time, meaning five years or more. What you would do is you would put that tree into shock by cutting it back 50%, an established tree 50%, okay? So you're gonna, you're gonna take out the dead diseased and damage. You are gonna see if there are any crossing branches, take those out, okay? Take out all the suckers and then see what you're left with. You may only be heading back, once you get all of that out, you may only be heading back that 20%, you know? Once you see what you have. And what I like to do is I like to do a couple of cuts, two or three cuts. I step back and I look at the tree again and then I go back in and I take two or three cuts and I step back uh, because every time you cut it really changes the perspective and the balance of the tree and I think since this is these are new trees to you that will be super beneficial maybe do one or two cuts step back you know and shape it from there can I interject before we do another um, yeah. uh, question um, before if we're having a few people drop off. So I want to make sure everybody gets this information. Um, as noted at the beginning, the webinars are recorded. Um, they will be uploaded um, and you can find them on the Enverhouse website on the workshop page where you normally would register and we'll send that link out. Um, and then they can also be found eventually on the City of Tacoma YouTube channel where we now have to post. Um, and we'll send that link. Um, the concern is that it does take us a little while to get those up because we have to depend on another department. Once we get them downloaded, we mm -hmm. send them to somebody else and then we have to wait until they have time to upload. So anyway, they will be available. We'll send you links. Um, when this is over, I will email um, people the links to the tree coupon, to the webinars if we have the link then. And then I also have an outline, which is not as detailed, but I have an outline that Jenny has done when we have the, this workshop at the Enviro House. I'll send you that outline. And I have a one page diagram of the um, tree collar and and um, where you do the cuts. The other thing that I don't think got covered was um, somebody had asked a question about tools and Jenny can go into that if she needs to, um, but Fiskar and Falco are two really good tools. Um, and I would recommend if you have questions about tools or you're not sure about any of the stuff we've talked about, check with your nursery. Garden Sphere has all that stuff. Really good nurseries will have those materials. You can take pictures of your trees or your problem areas take them to Garden Sphere or your, or your nursery that you frequent, and they can help answer questions when they can see what you're talking about. So um, I just wanted to throw that out. Um, and if you have any other questions that we haven't covered, um, you can email ehouse at cityoftacoma.org and we will get answers and get back to you on that, okay? Thank you, Janda. Yeah, there are a lot of questions that I'm 
we're not going to get to. They just keep coming in. There's there was a great turnout today, and I'm sorry we're just out of time well, at this point. Um, well, we can we can send those questions, and we'll try to get to them. Yeah. And if need be, we can repeat this workshop so that we can have more questions. That, um, you know, in another. Well, I don't know if we'll have time this spring, but we'll try. Could just be a, could just be a straight we'll Q and A. Just Bring your questions, your questions and, and we'll get answers to you. Yeah, it might. Yeah, so. Yeah, that totally. Yeah, just, <laughs> so those of you who did ask a bunch of questions, I tried to get through all of them, but we just are simply out of time today. Um, I'd like to thank Jenny from Garden Sphere for coming. It's always a pleasure, um, and all of you who joined us, please keep keep looking on the web page and join any other webinars coming up. I know we have the fruit trees, we have the mason bees which are also connected to how to get healthy, healthy fruit trees. So it's all, you know, it's all connected here. So um, let me add to that. Let yeah. me add to that Gator, because we're also doing, as I said, landscape trees on the 27th. I'm working on getting a date scheduled for doing heat pumps through with Tacoma Power. Um, Jenny will be doing chickens in March. We'll be doing oh, yeah. how to get started with chickens and how to build a coop and run. I'm trying to get someone to do um, one on building raised beds. Um, what else do we have, Gator? There were one or two. Oh, we have compost with uh, John Inch. Composting with John Inch yeah. with a new computer and hopefully um, a little better internet. <laughs> a little more um, complete presentation. So yeah. Um, yeah, we'll have a whole list of those out. And the electric vehicles. We're electric it's going to be. Vehicles. You know, we're back. And it's the new year, and we're ready. We, we're ready to just give it all out there. The information and. You know, yeah, so anything that's person. suitable for a webinar that we've done before or that we can add that's, that fits into our program, we will do so. So if Maybe you we'll do an apple pie one, one, all those oh, apples we, we made. No, all actually, we probably could. If right. Hal May is still on here, Hal could do it. <laughs> okay. So, thank well, you. thank you, everybody. We're going to um, shut down the webinar for today, but Jenny, and thank you. Uh, everybody else, take care. Anything you want to close with, Jenny? Uh, just that, you know, uh, we've got. Um, Travis and Gabe and Joseph and Audra uh, and myself over at Garden Sphere. And if you have any questions, give a jingle. You know, just give us a call. Um, we're all super willing to help. And we we can all do our best to help you with your questions. Um, and then if you know if it comes to it, we can do a, a Q and A. Jen and Gator, we could, <laughs> we totally could. So um, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.